Forest Spa, VOA1, the hits. Welcome to Learning English, a daily 30 minute program from the Voice of America. I'm Ashley Thompson. And I'm Dan Novak. This program is designed for English learners, so we speak a little slower and we use words and phrases especially written for people learning English. Today on the program, Brian Lynn tells us about Ukraine's process of developing attack drones. Later, Faith Perlo and Dan Novak present this week's education report. We close with the next part of our U.S. history series, The Making of a Nation. But first, here is Brian Lynn. A Ukrainian official says the country is developing attack drones designed to fight against Russian military aircraft. Ukraine's Minister of Digital Transformation, Mikhailo Fedorov, told the Associated Press the country wants to expand its use of drones in the war against Russia. Russian forces invaded Ukraine in February. So far, Ukraine has mostly used drones for military observation activities. But Fedorov said the next step is to develop drones with increased battle abilities. These are both exploding drones and drones that fly up to 3 to 10 kilometers and hit targets, he said. Russian officials have accused Ukraine of launching several drone strikes on military bases in recent weeks. In one attack, Russia said its forces shot down a drone entering the Engels Air Base. The air base sits inside Russia, about 600 kilometers from Ukraine's border. Russia's military said debris from the Ukrainian drone killed three soldiers but did not damage any aircraft. The base keeps bomber aircraft that Russia has used in attacks against Ukraine. Ukrainian military officials have not officially admitted to carrying out such drone strikes. Russia has used Iranian-made Shahed drones for its airstrikes in Ukrainian territory in recent weeks. Russia has used drones along with other weapons, including rockets, guided missiles, and artillery. Fedorov told the AP, I can say already that the situation regarding drones will change drastically in February or March. In his position, Fedorov oversees the country's internet and mobile communication systems. He admitted that it had been difficult to keep mobile communications operating for both civilian and military purposes during the war. At times, Fedorov said, fewer than half of mobile phone towers are operating in the capital Kiev. That is because Russian airstrikes have destroyed or damaged equipment that powers them. Ukraine's government is currently trying to link the country's mobile phone towers to backup power systems so they can keep operating when airstrikes damage equipment. The only backup systems currently available are ones like the Starlink Satellite Internet Service. Starlink is owned and operated by American technology company SpaceX. Starlink is designed to provide high-speed Internet service to rural and underconnected areas of the world. SpaceX chief Elon Musk 
began providing the service in Ukraine during the early days of the war, after Fedorov tweeted a request to Musk. About 24,000 Starlink stations are already in operation in Ukraine. The country is currently seeking support from its European Union partners to help bring at least 10,000 more stations to Ukraine. Fedorov compared SpaceX's donation of the Starlink system to other military equipment supplied by the United States. He noted the satellite internet service has helped the country's military improve its defense abilities against Russian forces. Thousands of lives were saved, he said. I'm Brian Lynn. What is the connection between Taylor Swift's songwriting and poems written by William Shakespeare? How does 19th century German philosopher Friedrich Nietzsche relate to Lana Del Rey's music? How do cultural attitudes toward the singers project modern feminist ideas? These are just some of the questions students explored while taking a course about one of the world-famous pop stars at the University of Texas, Austin, or New York University, or NYU. The classes are not just easy listening. They closely examine the singer's lyrics, influences, ideas, and place in American pop culture. Kathy Iandoli teaches a course at NYU called Topics in Recorded Music, Lana Del Rey. The professor is an experienced music reporter, writer, and critic. I said to the students, this is not to make you a Lana Del Rey fan, Iandoli told VOA, and we're not going to sit here and just have Lana Del Rey playlists and just kind of hang out every week together. But listening to the music was a big part of the class, and since it is taught within NYU's Clive Institute of Recorded Music, students were able to listen to Del Rey's music in a special classroom with good sound quality. That way, they could hear all the details the music had to offer. Iandoli says the course is a combination of music criticism, music business, and social commentary, and the course can get into some pretty complex subject matter. Del Rey, whose music often deals with mental health and complex relationships, is considered a pioneer of so-called sad girl pop. This has connections to the feminist sad girl theory. Iandoli said the theory expresses the idea that women use sadness as a tool of empowerment and resistance. Female songwriters of the past might be sad because a lover left them, but Del Rey and other sad girl pop singers are sad for another reason. They were the ones who left their lover. The sadness of today is almost empowering, because if you're the one breaking the heart, you're in control of the heartache, Iandoli explained. To learn about this idea, students read essays by feminist thinkers, watched films, and discussed the ideas in class. I like to assign things rooted in history, Iandoli said. The class on Taylor Swift at the University of Texas 
is all about connecting past and present. English professor of medieval literature, Elizabeth Scala, teaches the course. She wanted to find a way to get her first-year students interested in reading older writings and research methods. In the course called the Taylor Swift Songbook, Scala centers on Swift's songs as poetry. I started with treating Taylor Swift as kind of a poet and dealing with her lyrics as poetry, she said. And then I would often pair the songs with a Renaissance love poet. Scala said the course is designed to help students realize that poetry is a part of their everyday lives when they listen to music like Swift's. For example, students might see a connection between the popular music of today and writers like Shakespeare and Robert Frost. Through Swift's music, students learn poetry methods and structure. Scala noted that while students listen to poetry all the time in music, they may not recognize what it is. You're carrying it around in your pocket on your iPhone all the time, and you're constantly listening to it, Scala said. She added that while music lyrics often rhyme, modern poetry often does not. The professor also pairs swift songs with other readings, films, and plays, like Shakespeare's Romeo and Juliet. One song the students closely examined was Love Story from Swift's Fearless album. The song describes scenes from Romeo and Juliet. Students discuss Swift as a Juliet character in the song. Scala explains that Swift creates a fairy tale structure, but unlike the play, Swift as Juliet is very active. Scala says using the song helps ease the students into reading the first three parts of the play. Both classes explored the larger music industry surrounding the two artists, including the issue of how much control a writer has over their work. Iandoli assigned readings on pop music and female pop music branding. On the final day of class at Texas, one of Swift's early co-writers came to speak to the students. At NYU, Iandoli invited the representative who signed Del Rey to Interscope Records as a guest speaker. Iandoli said Del Rey is a great singer to study because she has influenced a new generation of female singers and songwriters. There is something very great about the music that she makes because she tapped into the human emotion and she spoke to these girls. And these girls later picked up guitars and pianos. Scala noted that Swift's songs help students see how difficult older poetry is not much different from poetry used in today's popular music. The way that you listen to and understand these songs is deeply embedded in the way in which poetry has worked for a thousand years, she said. I'm Faith Perlow. And I'm Dan Novak. You just heard Faith Perlow and Dan Novak present this week's education report. Faith joins me now to talk more about the story. Hi, Faith. Thanks for being here. Hi, Ashley. Thanks for having me. 
You and Dan wrote about two courses on musicians Taylor Swift and Lana Del Rey. You say that Lana was a pioneer of sad girl pop music. Could you tell us more about the word pioneer and how Lana Del Rey is one? I am guessing she did not move out west and settle new land. People might hear the word and think about the pioneers. Back in the 1800s, the pioneers were people that moved from the eastern part of the U.S. to areas out west. Lana actually did move from the state of New York to California for her career, but that is not how she is a pioneer. Pioneer means a person who helps to create and develop new ideas. Or methods, and sometimes they are the first to do something. Lana is a pioneer of a type of music. What are some other examples of pioneers? There are so many people who are pioneers in recent history. To name a few, Dr. May Jemison was the first black female astronaut to go into space. The current U.S. Vice President Kamala Harris is not only the first woman to serve in that role, but she is also the first Black and South Asian American to do so. And recently, we lost Barbara Walters, a pioneer of broadcasting and journalism. She was the first female co-anchor. Of a popular American news program in the 1970s. Thanks, Faith, for your explanations and examples today. I hope to have you back on the show again soon. Thanks, Ashley. Take care. Welcome to the making of a nation. American history in VOA special English. America's civil war in the 1860s did not have the full support of the people. Many said they did not care who won, north or south. They just wanted to be left alone. In the north. Many young men refused to be drafted into the Union Army. Some of their protests turned violent. Southern leaders were pleased with the anti-war movement in the North. Confederate General Robert E. Lee saw it as a sign of weakness in the Northern War effort. He also saw it as an opening for a military victory. Lee hoped for a final decisive blow that would bring the war to an end. Kay Gallant and Harry Monroe talk about General Lee's campaign north to Gettysburg, Pennsylvania. Gettysburg was a small town. Many roads came together there. Robert E. Lee needed those roads to pull his army together quickly. He had seventy thousand men in all, but they were spread over a wide area of southern Pennsylvania. Some were at York to the east, some were at Carlisle to the north, and most. Were at Chambersburg to the west. All of them were ordered to move against the Union force at Gettysburg. General Robert E. Lee had not planned to go to Gettysburg. He had planned to capture Harrisburg, the state capital, and then Philadelphia. If successful, he would turn south to seize Baltimore and Washington. Lee. Had not worried about the large Union Army of the Potomac. He believed it was far behind him in Virginia. 
but Lee was wrong. The Union Army had followed him, and it had reached Gettysburg first. The first group of northern soldiers formed a thin line of defense outside Gettysburg. The first group of southern soldiers attacked this line. It was the morning of July 1st, 1863. When the guns began to roar, both sides hurried more men to the front. After hours of fighting, the Confederates had pushed the Union soldiers back through the town. The Union soldiers formed a new line along a place called Cemetery Hill. General Robert E. Lee decided not to attack the hill immediately. He would wait for more men. But as he waited, more and more Union soldiers arrived. By sunrise the next day, Lee's 70,000 men faced a Union army of 90,000 men. The Confederates attacked both sides of the Union line. They moved the Union soldiers a little, but then the Union soldiers came back again. The Confederates could not hold the line. The fighting stopped at sunset. Union Commander George Meade met with his generals. He said he was sure General Lee would attack again the next day. The next attack, Meade said, would be against the center of the Union line. Meade was right. Lee planned to send 15,000 men against the Union center. They would be under the command of General George Pickett. When the sun rose on July 3rd, the Union troops were ready. They watched as the Confederate troops set up their cannon. More than 130 of these big guns were aimed at the center of the Union line. The morning passed. The day grew hotter. A little past one o'clock in the afternoon, a Confederate gun fired once, then again. That was the signal to attack. All at once, the Confederate artillery thundered with a deafening roar. The cannon sent iron and smoke into the Union soldiers on Cemetery Hill. Within minutes, hundreds lay dead or dying. Union artillery on the hill answered the Confederate cannon. Men lay flat on the ground. They prayed for the shelling to stop. Finally, it did, and the smoke of battle began to clear. Now the Union soldiers could see across the valley. They watched as the Confederate soldiers formed a long line. It was a sight to take your breath away. Facing Cemetery Hill, the Confederates stood shoulder to shoulder in a line almost two kilometers long. Sunlight shone from their guns. Their battle flags waved. Slowly, the line began to move. It seemed more like a parade than an attack. Shouts went up and down the Union line. Here they come. Here come the rebels. Thousands of Confederate soldiers moved across the valley outside Gettysburg. Union artillery opened fire. The guns tore open big holes in the Confederate battle line. 
but the Southerners kept moving forward up the hill. Union soldiers rose up from behind stone walls and fallen trees. They poured even more gunfire into the Confederate line. More and more bodies fell to the ground. Still the line moved forward. A few Confederates reached the Union line, but not enough to seize it. They were shot down. Suddenly the Confederates began racing down the hill. Many raised their hands in surrender. Fifteen thousand began the attack. Only half returned. The Battle of Gettysburg was over. The Union commander, General Meade, was told that the Confederate attack had been broken. He said simply, Thank God. The Confederate commander, General Lee, said, This has been a sad day for us. A sad day. Lee's invasion of the North had failed. There was only one thing he could do now, retreat. He must get his army back to Virginia. He could only hope that the Union army was hurt too badly to chase him. The line of wagons carrying wounded soldiers was twenty-five kilometers long. Many of the wounded needed treatment, but the wagons were not permitted to stop for any reason. Suffering was terrible. An officer who led the wagon train said he learned more about the horrors of war on that one trip than he had learned in all of his battles. Twenty thousand Confederate soldiers were killed, wounded, or listed as missing in the Battle of Gettysburg. Twenty-three thousand Union soldiers were killed, wounded, or missing. General Meade lost so many men that he was in no hurry to chase General Lee. He believed it might be best to let Lee escape than to take a chance on losing what remained of the Army of the Potomac. Meade waited for a week until his army was stronger, but by then Lee and his men had crossed safely back into Virginia. President Abraham Lincoln was angry. He had told General Meade that driving the Confederates out of the North was not enough. The Southern army must be destroyed. We had them, Lincoln said. We had only to stretch out our hands and take them, and nothing I could do or say could make the army move. President Lincoln believed that General Meade had made a mistake, but he felt that the general had ability. Lincoln was thankful for what Meade had done at Gettysburg. He said Meade would continue to command the Army of the Potomac. In November of 1863, President Lincoln went to Gettysburg he attended the opening of a new burial place for the Union soldiers who had died in the great battle there. The governor of Pennsylvania had asked the president to say a few words at the ceremony. Lincoln agreed. He felt it was his duty to go, to honor the brave men who lost their lives to save the Union. Lincoln hoped his words might help lift the spirit of the nation. Lincoln did not have much time to prepare his speech. He wrote it down the night before the ceremony. Lincoln was sure the speech was not a good one. But it came to be one of the most famous speeches in American history. And that's our program for today. 
Join us again tomorrow to keep learning English through stories from around the world. I'm Ashley Thompson.